I was excited to embark on a road trip with my closest friends. We had planned this trip for months, and I couldn't wait to hit the open road. Our destination was a cabin in the woods that we had rented for the weekend. We loaded up the car with snacks, drinks, and our overnight bags and set off on our journey. As we drove deeper into the night, I noticed that our GPS was acting strangely. It kept telling us to take a turn that didn't seem to exist, and the estimated arrival time kept getting later and later. Eventually, we found ourselves on a deserted road that we didn't recognize, and the GPS instructed us to turn onto it. The road was dark and eerie, and there were no streetlights to guide our way. As we drove further, we came across a sign that read Welcome to Eastwood. The sign was faded and covered in cobwebs, and the town itself looked like it had been abandoned for years. We decided to explore the town, thinking it would be a fun and spooky adventure. The silence was overwhelming, and the only sound we heard was our footsteps crunching on the gravel. The houses were all boarded up, and the windows were covered in dust and grime. Suddenly, we heard a faint whisper. We couldn't make out what it was saying, but it sounded like it was coming from behind us. We turned around, but there was no one there. As we continued to walk, the whispering grew louder. It was like a chorus of voices, all speaking at once. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and I knew that something wasn't right. We heard footsteps behind us, and we quickened our pace, thinking that it was just our imaginations. But the footsteps grew louder and faster, and I knew that someone or something was chasing us. As we walked down the deserted streets, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. It was so quiet, almost too quiet. The only sound was the crunch of our footsteps on the gravel road. The buildings around us were old and decrepit, their windows boarded up and doors locked tight. It was as if the town had been frozen in time, abandoned and forgotten. Suddenly, I heard a faint whisper coming from one of the buildings. I turned to my friends, but they hadn't heard anything. I brushed it off as my imagination and we continued walking. But the whispering grew louder and more distinct, and soon we all heard it. We followed the sound to a small house on the outskirts of town. The door was slightly ajar, and we could hear the whispers coming from inside. Without thinking, we pushed the door open and stepped inside. The interior was dark and musty, and we could barely make out the shapes of furniture and objects in the dim light but we could hear the whispers growing louder and more frantic. Suddenly, a figure stepped out of the shadows. It was a woman, her face pale and gaunt. She was wearing a long white dress that looked like it had been torn and stained with blood. Her eyes were sunken and dark, and she had a look of terror on her face. We tried to speak to her, but she didn't respond. Instead, she just kept repeating the same words over and over again, don't stay here. You have to leave. It's not safe. Suddenly, we heard a loud banging coming from the back of the house. It sounded like someone was trying to break down the door. The woman's eyes widened with fear and she grabbed our arms, urging us to leave. We ran out of the house as fast as we could, back into the quiet, deserted streets. But the banging continued, getting louder and more violent. We realized that we weren't alone in the town, and that someone or something was trying to keep us there. As we ran, we heard more whispers and footsteps behind us. It was as if the whole town was alive with ghosts and spirits, all trying to trap us there. We ran as fast as we could, but we couldn't shake the feeling that we were being followed. As we got back into the car and drove away, we realized that we had made a grave mistake by taking that shortcut. The whispers and ghostly apparitions followed us, haunting us for days afterwards. I don't know what happened in that town or why it was abandoned, but I know that I never want to go back there again. The memory of those whispers and ghostly apparitions still haunts me to this day. That night still haunts me, and I can't help but wonder what would have happened if we had stayed in Eastwood. I will never forget the ghostly whispers and the feeling of being watched by something evil. It was a night that I wish I could forget but it will always be burned into my memory. Now let's hop on to story number two. But before I begin reading, make sure that you have subscribed to Mr. Scare for regular horror podcasts. I was driving through a remote area in the middle of the night, trying to make it to my destination before sunrise. 
The winding road was surrounded by dense woods, with no signs of civilization in sight. I had been on the road for hours, and fatigue was starting to take its toll on me. That's when I saw her. A young woman, standing by the side of the road with her thumb out, looking for a ride. I slowed down and pulled over, feeling a twinge of guilt for leaving her out here in the middle of nowhere. Hey there, I said as she climbed into the passenger seat. Where are you headed? Anywhere but here, she replied, her voice barely above a whisper. I tried to make small talk, but she remained silent and distant, staring straight ahead. Her pale skin and dark eyes gave her an otherworldly appearance. I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. As we drove, I noticed that the road was becoming more and more treacherous. The trees loomed closer, casting ominous shadows across the road. The air grew colder, and a dense fog began to settle in. I asked the woman if she knew where we were going, but she remained silent. Suddenly, she pointed to a turn off up ahead. Turn here, she said, her voice barely audible. I hesitated, but something about her tone made me obey. As we turned onto the narrow, winding road, I felt a sense of dread wash over me. It was like we were driving into a trap. The road grew narrower and more treacherous as we went, with steep cliffs dropping off on either side. The woman remained silent, her gaze fixed ahead. I tried to turn back, but the road had disappeared behind us, replaced by an impenetrable fog. That's when I saw them. A group of ghostly figures, standing in the middle of the road. They were dressed in old-fashioned clothes, and their faces were twisted into grotesque masks of pain and suffering. I tried to swerve around them, but they seemed to be everywhere, surrounding us on all sides. The woman beside me suddenly let out a blood-curdling scream. I turned to her in horror, only to find that her face had changed. Her eyes were now dark pits, and her skin had taken on an unearthly pallor. I realized then that she was not a hitchhiker at all, but a ghostly apparition. The car began to shake violently, as if it was being torn apart. The ghostly figures closed in, their twisted hands reaching for me. I felt a cold hand on my shoulder, and turned to see the woman's ghostly face inches from mine. And then, just as suddenly as it had begun, I looked back to find no one there. I looked up at the rearview mirror to see if I could catch a glimpse of the hitchhiker again, but there was no one there. My heart raced as I realized that he had vanished into thin air. I tried to calm myself down, thinking it might have just been my imagination playing tricks on me, but I knew deep down that it was real. I drove for what felt like hours, my eyes scanning the darkness for any sign of the hitchhiker or any other potential danger. But the road ahead was empty, the only light coming from my headlights. Suddenly, I heard a loud thud, and the car started to shake violently. I swerved to the side of the road and got out to see what had happened. To my horror, I saw that one of my tires had burst, leaving me stranded in the middle of nowhere. I was about to call for help when I heard a voice behind me. It was the hitchhiker, and he was laughing. You thought you could escape, didn't you, he said, his eyes gleaming in the darkness. I froze, unable to move or speak. I was trapped, alone with this deranged spirit. The hitchhiker circled around me, his laughter growing louder and more sinister. I could feel his cold breath on my neck as he whispered in my ear. You're mine now. You'll never leave this place. I closed my eyes and tried to block out the horror and I kept driving for my life. I never looked back. My brain had stopped processing anything and everything that was happening. I don't remember how I got out of that horrific situation. But I never drove that road again, and I never picked up a hitchhiker again. The memory of that night still haunts me to this day. I've been driving for hours, trying to make it to my destination before the sun comes up. But the dense forest around me seems to go on forever. The only sounds are the hum of my engine and the rustling of leaves in the wind. Suddenly, I hear something else. A low growl coming from the trees on my left. I glance over, but I can't see anything in the darkness. I try to brush it off as my imagination, but then I hear it again. This time it's closer. My heart starts pounding as I realize that something is following me. 
I press on the accelerator, hoping to outrun whatever it is, but I can hear the growls getting louder and more frequent. Then, I see them. A pack of wolves running alongside my car. But these aren't normal wolves. They're massive, with fur as black as night and eyes that seem to glow in the darkness. I try to speed up, but they match my pace effortlessly. I can hear their claws scratching against the asphalt as they get closer and closer. I'm panicking now, frantically trying to think of a way out. And that's when I see it a sign for a small town up ahead. I don't know if it's my best option, but I don't have any other choice. I veer off the road and into the town, hoping to lose the wolves in the maze of streets. The town is deserted. The only sounds are the creaking of old signs and the howling of the wind. I drive through the empty streets, trying to find a way out. But no matter which turn I take, the wolves are still there, hot on my tail. I can feel their hot breath on my neck as I race down the main street. And then, I see a figure up ahead. A man, standing in the middle of the road, waving his arms frantically. I slow down, hoping he can help me. But as I get closer, I realize that something is off about him. His eyes are glowing, just like the wolves. I slam on the brakes, but it's too late. The man leaps onto my car and starts pounding on the windshield. I can see his teeth, sharp and glistening in the moonlight. I don't know how I managed to do it, but I hit the gas and peel out of the town, leaving the wolves and the strange man behind. As I frantically tried to find my way out of the forest, the howls of the werewolves grew louder and more frequent. They seemed to be getting closer with every passing second, and I knew that I had to find a way to protect myself. Suddenly, I saw a small cabin up ahead, and I quickly pulled over and ran inside, slamming the door shut behind me. The cabin was old and musty, with cobwebs covering the corners of the room. There was a small fire burning in the fireplace, but other than that, the room was empty. I knew I couldn't stay here for long, as the werewolves would surely find me eventually. I needed to come up with a plan, and fast. As I paced back and forth, I noticed a book on the table. It was old and worn, with the title Werewolf Floor printed on the cover. I quickly flipped through the pages, hoping to find some useful information. According to the book, there were only a few ways to kill a werewolf, with silver, decapitation, or fire. I didn't have any silver on me, and I wasn't about to try to decapitate a werewolf, so fire was my only option. I quickly gathered some kindling and set it alight, hoping that the smoke would keep the werewolves at bay. As the fire grew bigger, I heard a loud banging on the door. The werewolves had found me. I grabbed a torch and waited by the door, ready to defend myself. As the door burst open, I saw the snarling faces of the werewolves. With a quick swipe, I set them ablaze, watching as they howled in agony and retreated back into the darkness. I knew that I couldn't stay in the cabin forever, so I quickly gathered my things and got back in my car. As I drove away, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, and I knew that I would never forget this terrifying encounter with the supernatural. I don't know what I saw that night. I don't know if it was real or if it was all in my head. But I do know one thing, I'll never forget the fear and panic that consumed me as I drove through that dark, lonely forest. I've always been fascinated by the paranormal, so when my group of friends suggested a haunted road trip, I was all in. We planned out our route, marking all the stops along the way where we could potentially encounter ghosts, spirits, or other supernatural entities. Our first stop was an abandoned mental asylum on the outskirts of town. We parked our car outside the decaying building and made our way inside. As we explored the creepy hallways, we heard unexplained sounds and felt sudden drops in temperature. But that was just the beginning. Our next stop was an old cemetery that was rumored to be haunted by the ghost of a murdered woman. As we walked among the gravestones, we heard whispers in the wind and saw shadowy figures moving among the trees. Despite the unnerving experiences, we pushed on to our next destination, an abandoned hotel that had been the site of a brutal murder-suicide. As we walked through the silent corridors, we felt an oppressive sense of dread that made it difficult to breathe. 
But things really took a turn for the worse when we arrived at our final stop, an isolated stretch of road that was said to be haunted by a vengeful ghost. As we drove down the deserted road, we heard strange noises and saw flickering lights in the distance. Suddenly, our car's engine died, leaving us stranded in the middle of the haunted road. We tried to start the engine again, but it wouldn't budge. That's when we heard it, a ghostly voice whispering our names from outside the car. Panic set in as we realized that we were completely surrounded by spirits. We could see their ghostly forms pressing against the car windows, reaching out for us. We were trapped. Thankfully, after multiple attempts, the engine roared back to life. As we drove away, I could feel a strange energy in the air, as if the spirits of the dead were watching us. We stopped at an old cemetery, where we got out and walked around the headstones. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me, and every sound seemed to make me jump. As we drove away, I saw a figure standing by one of the graves. I couldn't make out who it was, but I had the feeling that they were staring right at me. We continued our journey, visiting other haunted locations, but the sense of unease continued to grow. At our final destination, an abandoned hospital, we decided to split up and explore the building alone. I wandered through the dark, eerie corridors, feeling as if I was being watched by unseen eyes. Suddenly, I heard a faint whispering voice, as if someone was trying to communicate with me. I followed the voice to a room at the end of the hall, where I found a group of people gathered around a Ouija board. They invited me to join them, and before I knew it, I was asking questions to the spirits that had apparently possessed the board. But then, the atmosphere in the room suddenly changed. The temperature dropped, and I felt a cold breeze on the back of my neck. The board spelled out a chilling message, you should not have come here. That's when I saw them, shadowy figures lurking in the corners of the room. They started to move closer, and I realized that we had awakened something sinister. We tried to run, but the door was locked from the outside, trapping us inside. As the ghostly figures closed in, we huddled together in fear. That's when we saw her the ghost of a young woman, her face twisted in rage and hatred. She had come for us, and there was no escape. I don't remember much of what happened next but I do remember the screams and the feeling of being dragged down into darkness. When I woke up, I was lying on the ground outside, my friends were nowhere to be seen. I got up and ran, not daring to look back. I never spoke of what happened that night, but I never forgot it either. I learned that some things are better left alone, and that there are some places where even the bravest of souls should never venture. I was driving home from work, tired and ready to collapse into my bed. It was already midnight, and the roads were empty, except for my car. I turned on some music, trying to stay awake, but as I drove, I couldn't help but feel like something was off. There were strange shadows moving around me, darting in and out of the corners of my eyes. I tried to shake it off, thinking it was just my tired mind playing tricks on me, but the feeling persisted. Suddenly, I saw a figure appear in the middle of the road, illuminated by my headlights. I slammed on my brakes, my heart pounding in my chest. As I came to a stop, the figure disappeared, leaving me alone in the dark. I tried to rationalize what I had seen, thinking it was just a trick of the light, but deep down, I knew something was wrong. As I continued to drive, the shadows grew more prominent, and I saw more and more figures appearing on the side of the road. They looked like people, but their features were indistinct, their faces twisted and blurred. I felt like I was driving through a nightmare, and I couldn't escape it. Suddenly, I saw a woman appear on the side of the road, her face pale and her eyes empty. I tried to look away, but I couldn't. She seemed to be beckoning me, urging me to follow her. Without thinking, I turned off the main road and followed her into the darkness. As I drove, I realized that I had no idea where I was. The road had become narrower, and the trees were thicker, blocking out the moonlight. I saw more and more figures appearing in the shadows, their eyes following me as I drove past them. I felt like I was being watched, like they were all waiting for something. Finally, I saw a figure standing in the middle of the road. It was the woman I had seen earlier, her eyes fixed on me. I tried to swerve to avoid her, 
but she disappeared, and I heard a sickening thud as my car hit something. I slammed on my brakes and got out, my heart racing as I saw what I had hit. It was a woman, her body twisted and broken. She looked like the woman I had seen on the side of the road, but her eyes were open now, staring at me accusingly. I felt sick to my stomach, realizing that I had just killed someone. But then, I saw her body start to fade away, and I heard the whispers of the other figures around me. They were congratulating me, praising me for what I had done. I realized then that I was not being haunted by a ghost, but that I was the ghost, the one that had been waiting for this moment for years. I was the one who had died on this road, and now I was doomed to haunt it forever, waiting for someone to take my place. The figures around me were all ghosts like me, waiting for their turn to be set free. And now, I had become one of them. It was a dark and stormy night, and I was driving home alone after a long day at work. I couldn't wait to read home and relax. I had been working late and had not noticed that my car was running low on gas. Suddenly, in the middle of nowhere, my car sputtered and died, leaving me stranded on the side of the deserted road. At first, I was calm and relaxed until it started to rain heavily. The wind was howling outside, and the rain was pelting my car. I hate rain, especially when I'm outside my home traveling to and fro. I tried starting my car again hoping it would start this time, but it wouldn't turn on. I kind of was losing my temper. After multiple tries, I gave up and realized that I had no choice but to get out on the road and find help. As I stepped out of his car, I felt a chill run down my spine. It was cold and windy outside. It was still raining pretty heavily. I felt as though something was watching me, something that I couldn't see. I looked around but saw nothing but darkness and the rain pouring down. The sound of the rain and wind made it hard to hear anything else. I shook it off thinking it was nothing but my imagination playing games with me. I never believed in spirits or ghosts. But then suddenly, there was a whisper. I heard a voice whisper my name. My heart skipped a beat. I turned around, but there was no one there. I again tried to brush it off as my imagination, but I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was off. Maybe someone or something was following me? There were no vehicles passing by this road plus no sign of life. As I walked down the road, I saw an old abandoned house in the distance. I thought of visiting the house and asking for help or maybe seeking shelter therein. But as I approached, I saw a figure in the window. I wasn't able to make out who or what it was, but I could feel its eyes on him. I tried to ignore it and continued walking towards the door. I pressed the doorbell and knocked to ask for help but nobody answered the door. I waited for a few minutes until I pushed the door open out of curiosity. As I entered cautiously, I was greeted by a musty smell, and the sound of creaking floorboards echoed throughout the house. It was an old, abandoned house that looked like it had not been lived in for years. I walked around attentively, looking for any signs of life or shelter. As I was walking, I heard a noise coming from upstairs. It sounded like someone was walking around. I shouted for help again in case anybody was able to listen to me. I slowly made my way up the stairs, but as I got closer, the noise stopped. Something felt wrong. As I reached the top of the stairs, I saw a figure in the distance, standing in the hallway. It was a ghostly figure, and it seemed to be staring straight right at me. I was terrified and frozen in fear. The ghostly figure started walking towards me, and I realized that I had to get out of there. I turned around and ran down the stairs but as he reached the bottom, the door slammed shut, and the lights went out. I was now in complete darkness, and I could feel somebody's presence in the room closing in on him. I tried to find my way out, but I stumbled and fell, hitting my head on the floor. I was unable to move. I felt paralyzed. As I lay there, I could hear the sound of footsteps getting closer and closer. I tried to scream, but my voice was gone. I thought this was it. This might be the end of my life. I am about to die. Weird animal and bird noises echoed in the room. I closed my eyes thinking of my final moment when the door slammed open. 
the lights came back on and I was surrounded by a group of people. They had come to my rescue. It so happens that they had heard about the abandoned house and had come to investigate. I was relieved, but I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was not right. I asked them for their help, still second-guessing if I should trust them. As I got into their car, I again saw the ghostly figure in the window, looking straight at me. I knew that I had escaped something terrible, but I was not sure if he had truly left the ghostly figure behind. To be honest, I still am not sure. From that day on, I never drove down that road again, and I never forgot the terror that I had experienced that night. Now let's hop on to story number 2, but before I begin reading, make sure that you have subscribed to Mr. Scare for regular horror podcasts. I had never been afraid of driving alone at night, in fact, I prefer driving alone at night all by myself. But this was until the night I almost felt my soul leave my body. After that night, I might never drive alone at night. It was late, around midnight, and I was driving home from a friend's house. The road was dark and deserted, with no street lights to light the way. All I had were my car's headlights. I was lost in my thoughts, listening to music and enjoying the silence when suddenly someone appeared in front of my car. I hit the brakes hard, and my car came to a screeching halt. I got out of the car to see what had happened in case I ran over a small animal, but there was no one there. I looked around, but there was no one in sight. There was an unusual and unsettling silence outside. I was about to get back in the car when I heard a faint whisper. It was coming from somewhere behind me. I turned around and tried calling out but there was still no one there. As I got back into my car, I felt a strange sensation. My car's engine was acting abnormally. The car was revving and the headlights were flickering. I was sure that something was wrong, but I didn't know what. That's when I heard it. A faint tapping sound coming from the roof of my car. I looked up and there was a figure on the roof of my car. There was a man, but he had a ghostly appearance. His clothes were tattered and old, and his skin was pale and translucent. I couldn't see his face clearly, but I could tell that he was staring at me. I was frozen with fear. I couldn't wrap my head around what I was seeing. I tried to start my car, but the engine wouldn't turn over. The man on the roof of my car was getting closer and closer, and I knew I had to do something. Without any second thought, I decided to abandon my car and started to run in the opposite direction towards a huge tree. I ran as fast as I could, but the man was following me. I could hear his footsteps getting closer and closer. As I turned around, I saw the man standing behind me. He seemed to be floating in the air, and his face was twisted into a grotesque expression. I could see through him, and he was holding something in his hand. It seemed like some old pocket watch, and it was ticking loudly. It was so horrific that I lost all my strength and felt as cold as ice. I turned around and kept running and shouted for help hoping someone around would come to my rescue. I looked around for any sign of life or any other car for help. I had no idea where I was running towards. All I knew was that something terrible was about to happen. As I ran, I could hear his voice whispering in my ear. He was telling me things, things that I couldn't understand. It felt like some foreign whispers. I tried shouting back at him asking him to stay away from me. I was terrified, but I kept running. Eventually, I came to a crossroads, and I saw a light in the distance. I was so happy to see the light that I dragged myself toward it. It was a gas station. I ran towards it with all my life. My heart was pounding and my Brian was as numb as I could remember. When I got to the gas station, I collapsed on the ground. I was shaking and my heart was racing. The gas station attendant saw me and called an ambulance. I was taken to the hospital and the doctors said that I had a panic attack. But I knew it was more than that. That night was not normal, no matter what anyone says. I wasn't dreaming or hallucinating after a long day. Something was there. I had seen a ghost, and it had followed me. It had tried to take me with it, to the other side. I don't know what it wanted from me, but I know that I'll never forget that night. And I'll never drive alone at night again.
It was a dark and stormy night, and my family and I were driving back to our home in the city after spending a relaxing weekend at our farmhouse. It was a perfect getaway from my daily boring routine. But it was time to go back home now. It was well past midnight and we had been on the road for hours, with nothing but the sound of the rain pounding against the car to keep us company. As we drove down the deserted road, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. The only light came from our car's headlights, which illuminated the thick fog that seemed to surround us on all sides. The silence was only broken by the occasional clap of thunder in the distance. Suddenly, without any warning, the car started to sputter and jerk. We were out of gas. Panic set in as we realized we were stranded in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night, with no one around for miles. Just as we were starting to despair, we noticed a faint light in the distance. It looked like a house, and we could only hope that someone there would be able to help us. As we approached the house, we could see that it was an old, dilapidated mansion, with broken windows and a front door that looked like it hadn't been opened in years. But we had no other choice. We had to try and find help. We cautiously stepped out of the car and made our way to the front door. It creaked open with a loud groan, as if it was protesting our intrusion. The inside of the house was just as creepy as the outside. The furniture was covered in cobwebs, and the air was musty and stale. We called out, but there was no answer. It seemed as if the house was completely abandoned. We decided to split up and search for a phone or some other means of communication. As I was searching the ground floor, I heard a strange noise coming from upstairs. It sounded like someone was shuffling around, but I couldn't see anyone. I called out to my family, but they didn't answer. I started to feel a sense of dread wash over me. What if we weren't alone in the house? I made my way up the stairs, each step creaking loudly underfoot. As I reached the top of the stairs, I saw something that made my blood run cold. What I saw next was beyond my wildest dream. I couldn't believe my eyes. Standing in front of me was the ghostly figure of a family, a man, a woman, and two young children. They were all dressed in old-fashioned clothing, with messy long hair and their faces were twisted in an expression of anger and despair. I couldn't move. I was frozen in fear as they started to advance towards me. I could feel the coldness emanating from them. I lost all my senses. Was I hallucinating or is it real? Just as they were about to reach me, I heard my family calling out to me. It shook me and I looked below and then towards the ghostly family again. But to my surprise there was no one this time. The ghosts disappeared, and I was suddenly back in the present moment. We found a phone and immediately called for help. As we waited for someone to come I told my mother of what I saw upstairs. She seemed to believe me but was in a denial mode. It so happens that my mother saw a similar showdown of people in the living area. We all huddled together, too scared to speak. We knew that there was something wrong with the place and the shadows we saw were not just hallucination. We had a strong feeling that we had just narrowly escaped a fate worse than death. From that day on, we never spoke of what had happened at the haunted mansion. But I knew that it would stay with me for the rest of my life. The memory of those ghosts would haunt me forever. I was driving with my friend, Emma, to a house party that was out of town. We were both excited to be going to a party away from our usual spots. Our semester exams were finally over and this was supposed to be our YOLO kind of party. But seems life fate had something else planned for us. The night was dark and foggy, and we were blasting music and singing along. We were casually chatting about life in general and were going about our usual gossip. Suddenly, Emma gasped, and I turned to see what was wrong. Did you see that? Emma asked, pointing to the car behind us. I looked in the rearview mirror and saw a dark sedan with its headlights off following us. I couldn't make out who was driving, but it gave me a creepy feeling. I tried to shake off the feeling and focus on driving. Maybe they're just going to the same party or nearby somewhere, I said, trying to reassure Emma and myself. As we drove on, the car behind us stayed close. We took a few turns, but it still followed us. 
I could see that Emma was getting scared, and so was I. Suddenly, the car sped up and pulled alongside us. I turned to look, and I saw a pale face with black eyes staring at us. I screamed and swerved, almost crashing into a ditch. Let's go back home, Emma said, her voice shaking. Unsure of what to do next, I agreed and turned the car around to play it safe. As we drove back, the car followed us, never leaving our side. We tried to speed up, but the car kept up with us easily. We were both panicking now, wondering what was happening. We tried calling our friends and families, but the network was no longer reachable. Finally, we arrived back in town and drove straight to my house. We parked the car and ran inside, locking all the doors and windows. We both collapsed on the couch, panting and trying to catch our breath. What the hell was that? Emma asked, her voice trembling. I don't know, I replied, still shaken up. But we need to figure it out. We casually searched on the internet if this was some kind of a sign or signal, trying to find any information on the car and the person behind the wheel. But as expected, we found nothing useful, only stories of similar experiences that other people had gone through. As we dug deeper, we found a legend about a ghost that haunted that very road we had driven on. According to the legend, a woman had died in a car accident on that road, and her ghost now haunted it, looking for her next victim. The story sent chills down our spines. It did not make any sense, but there was no reason to deny or discard the possibility either. It felt far-fetched. But the thought of the remote possibility that we might have had been followed by a ghostly presence was terrifying. The next day, we felt curious about last night's incident and so we went back to the road in daylight to see if we could find any clues. We saw nothing out of the ordinary, but as we drove back home, we noticed something strange. The same car that had followed us was now parked by the roadside near my house. We approached the car cautiously and peered inside. There was no one in the driver's seat, but we could feel a cold breeze blowing from within. Suddenly, the car door slammed shut on its own, and we heard a ghostly whisper in our ears. Get out, the voice said, and we screamed and ran away. From that day on, we never drove down that road again, and we always made sure to keep the doors and windows locked at night. I had never been afraid of driving alone at night, in fact, I preferred driving alone at night all by myself. But this was until the night I almost felt my soul leave my body. After that night, I might never drive alone at night. It was late, around midnight, and I was driving home from a friend's house. The road was dark and deserted, with no street lights to light the way. All I had were my car's headlights. I was lost in my thoughts, listening to music and enjoying the silence when suddenly someone appeared in front of my car. I hit the brakes hard, and my car came to a screeching halt. I got out of the car to see what had happened in case I ran over a small animal, but there was no one there. I looked around, but there was no one in sight. There was an unusual and unsettling silence outside. I was about to get back in the car when I heard a faint whisper. It was coming from somewhere behind me. I turned around and tried calling out but there was still no one there. As I got back into my car, I felt a strange sensation. My car's engine was acting abnormally. The car was revving and the headlights were flickering. I was sure that something was wrong, but I didn't know what. That's when I heard it. A faint tapping sound, coming from the roof of my car. I looked up, and there was a figure on the roof of my car. There was a man, but he had a ghostly appearance. His clothes were tattered and old, and his skin was pale and translucent. I couldn't see his face clearly, but I could tell that he was staring at me. I was frozen with fear. I couldn't wrap my head around what I was seeing. I tried to start my car, but the engine wouldn't turn over. The man on the roof of my car was getting closer and closer, and I knew I had to do something. Without any second thought, I decided to abandon my car and started to run in the opposite direction towards a huge tree. I ran as fast as I could, but the man was following me. I could hear his footsteps getting closer and closer. As I turned around, I saw the man standing behind me. He seemed to be floating in the air, and his face was twisted into a grotesque expression. 
I could see through him, and he was holding something in his hand. It seemed like some old pocket watch, and it was ticking loudly. It was so horrific that I lost all my strength and felt as cold as ice. I turned around and kept running and shouted for help hoping someone around would come to my rescue. I looked around for any sign of life or any other car for help. I had no idea where I was running towards. All I knew was that something terrible was about to happen. As I ran, I could hear his voice whispering in my ear. He was telling me things, things that I couldn't understand. It felt like some foreign whispers. I tried shouting back at him asking him to stay away from me. I was terrified, but I kept running. Eventually, I came to a crossroads, and I saw a light in the distance. I was so happy to see the light that I dragged myself toward it. It was a gas station. I ran towards it with all my life. My heart was pounding and my Brian was as numb as I could remember. When I got to the gas station, I collapsed on the ground. I was shaking and my heart was racing. The gas station attendant saw me and called an ambulance. I was taken to the hospital and the doctors said that I had a panic attack. But I knew it was more than that. That night was not normal, no matter what anyone says. I wasn't dreaming or hallucinating after a long day. Something was there. I had seen a ghost, and it had followed me. It had tried to take me with it, to the other side. I don't know what it wanted from me, but I know that I'll never forget that night. And I'll never drive alone at night again. Ever since I was a little kid, I've always been a night owl. I have never been able to fall asleep easily, so I have a tendency to read, surf around, or occasionally just pace around the house. I lived on a farm, so on nights when the moon was light enough, I would go walk in the pasture if I felt so. And on one night, I was feeling particularly restless, so I decided to go for a walk. I pulled on a pair of jeans and some shoes thinking that a walk would help me relax. Stepping out onto the porch, some movement near the barn caught my eye. In the light, I could make out the figure of a man carrying something. The sound of the door opening must have alerted him, because he started coming towards me. The distance from our porch to the stock barn is about 25 yards, so it wasn't a terribly large distance, and even in the dim light I was able to realize the man had a gun. I backed into the house and deadbolted the door. My heart was racing. Living in a small town in rural Texas, I knew that the door had been unlocked from the outside before. Terrified, I stumbled into my parents' room and woke my father. I told him I'd seen a man with a gun in our backyard, and he quickly grabbed his shotgun and told my mom to call the cops. Since we lived far out, it would be 20 or so minutes before we would see any police, so dad and I went out to check on the animals. When we stepped outside, it was dead quiet. There was no sign of anyone in our yard, so we walked briskly towards the barn where I'd seen the man. At that time, we had a few cattle, goats, a bad-tempered donkey, about a half dozen chickens, and my old cat. None of them were to be seen, and the barn was completely empty. They slept close by, and the goats weren't penned at night, but they always slept inside the barn. Something had spooked them out of their sleep, but there was no sign of anyone. We did a quick sweep of the area and found that someone had tried to force the door to the attached tool shed to open and failed, but otherwise, nothing was really missing. After searching for a while and finding nothing, we gave up and hung out in the barn waiting for the cops. The electricity ran into the barn near a small enclosed chicken coop, and my dad kept a small fridge out there with a padlock on it. He opened it up and produced two beers while we waited. The cops came and we searched again, finding footprints in the cracked doorframe of the shed where the guy had tried to enter, but no real damage. After the cops left, we finished our beers leaning against the coop, and eventually went to bed thinking that we'd spooked the guy, and he'd left for good. And we were kinda correct. We had spooked the guy, but apparently, he wasn't able to find a way off of the property. In the morning when we went out to collect the eggs, we had a pretty horrible surprise. Of all the places we'd looked, we never thought to check inside the chicken coop, which was a fairly large area. So it seemed like, whoever this guy was, had decided to hide out in there when we came outside. 
Every one of our chickens had been killed presumably to keep them quiet. While we were leaning against the coop relaxing and drinking our beers, this guy had been inside of it killing our chickens the entire time. We never found the guy, but henceforth I always reconsidered going out for a walk at night time, and was always on the lookout for anything suspicious around our farm. Now let's hop on to story number 2, but before I begin reading, make sure that you have subscribed to Mr. Scare for regular horror podcasts. When I was a little kid, maybe around 6 or 7, I used to go and visit my uncle and aunt's lodge during the school holidays. Their lodge was on this huge property that they owned, and the lodge backed onto the edge of bushland. So my elder brother and I always had a whole bunch of stuff to do, to keep ourselves occupied during the day. I remember one fine day, I was with my dog, and we were playing near an empty creek, when he suddenly just took off into the trees. And it was very sudden. You know as if he had an abrupt change of mind, and he dashed into the trees. Everyone else had gone into town, and my dad was fast asleep inside the house. It was late evening, and now I knew that he was a deep sleeper, so I was pretty much alone out there, so I took a call and decided to go after my dog. He was much quicker than I was, and I got lost pretty quickly. I was starting to get a bit upset because I couldn't find my dog, and at the same time, I had no idea where I was. So I turned around from where I thought I came from, and tried to run back toward my house to get my dad, so he could help me find him. From what I remember, I tripped over a tree root or something, and fell down this embankment. I must have hit my head on something, because I woke up at the bottom of this small gully, not knowing how I got there. It felt like everything was still a bit fuzzy. What actually woke me up, was my dog licking my face. He was lying down right next to me. I still don't know as to how he found me, but I was really happy to see him there. But then he started barking profusely. But it was a bark I hadn't really heard him do before, and he was still lying flat on his stomach. That was the strange thing that I remember about that barking. A really strange lying down, grumble sort of bark. It made me scared and a little bit uncomfortable. I turned to see what he was looking at, and there was a guy standing there. I remember he had this really faded cowboy hat thing on. But his hat had a big chunk missing on the side. He said in this really, really deep voice. Hey kid, you had a pretty bad fall, but you should be alright. Let me get you back to your home. Then he walked over to me, picked me up, grabbed my hand and we started walking back through the bush. The two things I remember from that walk were holding his gloves which I thought was very weird because it was the middle of summer and really hot at the time. The other one was my dog who was walking a little too close to me. South close to a point that I was pretty much tripping the whole way back because he kept smacking into the side of my leg on the way back. The guy didn't say anything though, in fact, I don't actually remember him saying anything at all apart from the first time he spoke. I don't think we walked for that long because we reached the creek bed really quickly, and I could hear my name being called out by my dad for dinner. I started to run up to the house, and remembered I forgot to thank the guy for getting me there, so I turned to yell. Thanks, mister! But he was already gone. I just figured he was in a hurry or something. A few days later I was in the supermarket with my mom, it was one of those small country town ones that kind of sell everything, and everyone knows everyone else there. So I'm kind of just wandering around, and there's this photo up on the wall of this guy in a cowboy hat, with a big chunk in the side missing. It was the guy who helped me in the woods. I wanted to thank him or something for helping me before, so I asked the person working there who he was. It turned out that he was the owner of the store around 25 years ago but died in a freak accident in the woods, almost where my dog and I were. Apparently, back in the day, he used to grow vegetables for the store by himself, in the middle of these woods. He went one day to see how they were growing, when a really bad storm hit the town. The report suggested that he was trying to get back, but his dog, who always went with him, fell down a really steep embankment into a small gully, so this guy went after it. While he was down there, a branch broke off a tree and hit him, breaking his back. They didn't find him till weeks later. His dog was also found with him, by his side. It died of starvation. That's how I found out about Mr. Roger anyway. 
And now, after two decades, I can totally grasp the situation. His spirit must have related to our situation. Had he gotten any help back when he fell, he too would have been alive today. But if not for what happened to him, I might not have been alive to tell the tale. About three years back, I was chilling in my bed after having just finished reading a graphic novel. It was around midnight, and that too in the middle of winter. So you can totally imagine how chilly it would have been back then. I couldn't sleep for some reason, maybe because my mind was still overwhelmed by the ending of the novel. So I lay awake staring at the ceiling with my pet dog snoring away next to me. Suddenly, I heard three loud thumps from the glass of the window across the room. They sounded very hard and very steady. It sounded like someone was pounding on the glass with the flat of their hand. The sound scared the shit out of me and woke my dog too, who started barking at the window. I sat there trying to reassure him, and maybe myself too, that it was okay, and that there was some sensible reason for it. After a few minutes of panic, we both calmed down, he went back to sleep, and even I slept about half an hour later. Once again, I was woken up in the middle of the night by the same sound. Three loud and distinct thumps on the wall. The sound came from the same window, with the same steady interval between thumps, and just as loud as before. Just like last time, my dog woke up again, and started barking at the window. Both of us were freaking out, and I couldn't bring myself to turn on the light and go look out the window. The only thing that I could think to do, was run out into the living room, curl up on the couch with the dog, and spend the night with a blanket over both our heads. The next morning I woke on the couch feeling exhausted, having slept only intermittently. The dog was sitting at the door to my room looking alert, looking back at me, and whining. I went back into my bedroom and looked out the window. There was nothing unusual looking. No marks on the glass or anything. My apartment is on the top floor of our five-story building. The fire escape was on the window nearest to the bed, and not on the one near the window where the sound came from. In simple words, whatever had hit the window, had had a six-story drop beneath it. At a loss for any other reasonable explanation, I figured it must have been a bird running into the window. I had no explanation for the fact that it seemed to do so three times in a row, at very steady intervals, on two separate occasions, and with a sound much louder than could be made by a lightweight creature bouncing off the glass. Moreover, the simple fact that it had happened late at night, at a time when birds aren't typically flying around, made me a little nervous. I also carefully ignored it in my hope of some sane explanation. Somewhat satisfied with my rationalization, I went to work and felt much better for the rest of the day. I was doing fine and trying to focus on my work. But the thought kept bouncing off my mind. I knew something was off. I was a little over the incident, until one last fact filtered into my mind. It dwelt there for the rest of the workday nagging at me, and I rushed home to confirm my suspicions. Reaching the window again, just as the sun was setting, I saw my troublesome suspicion was accurate. There was a screen on the outside of the window. The noise had very clearly been the sound of the glass being struck and not the screen. Whatever had hit the window, had to have done so from inside the room. I called my friend to stay with me for the next few days, and then I moved to a new place. I mean nothing of that sort ever happened again, and I never heard a similar knocking at night. But I did not want to stay with the possibility of living with a paranormal being. I work in the emergency medical services, and it is literally a 24-hour job, be it day or night. One night, I picked up the duty on the night shift. We get a call for an unknown condition, at an address that gets changed like five times, before we are flagged down by a frantic woman, in front of a huge Masonic temple. She tells us that her boyfriend is the custodian there, and he is in charge of locking up every night. He texted her about one hour ago, saying that he had crushing chest pain and shortness of breath, and now he's not answering her texts. The door is locked, but she knows he's inside, because his car is there and there are lights that are turned on, on the inside. The huge wooden doors are locked, so we call for firefighters to break them down. They take like 20 minutes to smash a 12 feet tall wooden door off its hinges. 
once we manage to finally enter, we realize that it's pretty spooky. I don't know if y'all have ever been in a Masonic temple before, but they're scary as shit with all the lights off. Marble floors and columns, lots of velvet curtains, and no light switches to be found. Me, my partner, my girlfriend, and five firemen start searching the place room by room, floor by floor. We are totally expecting to find a corpse, and possibly a ghost or two. We clear the first floor, and find nothing. We were terrified but at the same time on duty. Once the floor was cleared, we started to move up the stairs. An interesting thing about Masonic temples, is that they tend to get stranger, the higher up you go in them. By the third floor of the temple, all of us are freaking the hell out, and even jumping at shadows. Somehow we push onwards to the fifth and final floor. At this point, we were just desperate to finish the search, and get the hell out of that creepy place. It gave off a very negative vibe. At this point, there is a huge spooky chandelier above us, weird symbols painted everywhere, and even the fire lieutenant is getting freaked out. The top floor consists of a big room with a long hallway leading off it. All the way down the pitch black hallway, we can see a door that has the lights on behind it. We slowly creep towards it, none of us wanting to be first in line. Eventually, we reach the doorway and after a solid minute of silently miming who should open the door, my partner and I agree that we'll do it together. We take a couple of deep breaths, silently count to three, and throw the door open. As our eyes adjust to the light, we see a middle-aged man jump up from a desk, rip off his headphones, and frantically try to turn off the super hardcore porn he's been watching. He, apparently, had texted his girlfriend saying he had had a burrito for dinner. He mentioned that the food didn't quite agree with him, and she had wildly misunderstood his text. As we all fled the building, we could still hear the couple arguing as he began to wonder how we had gotten into the building, and who would compensate them for their door. Fairly long time ago, I worked at a base in Japan. Now, most US facilities in Japan are former Japanese bases, and we share most of the bases with the JSDF. One particular night, I remember that I was guarding the fuel depot. No creepy spooky history to it. It was just a bunch of big hills where fuel tanks were and still are buried. There is a Japanese neighborhood just beyond the perimeter fence too. So hearing people carry on and seeing house lights are quite common in that base. Most of the watch, I sit in a guard shack, which is also the only entrance and exit point to the base. It's a big automatic gate that only I, and the office has access to. But the office is locked because the fuel guys go home at 6 in the evening. So I'm locked behind a 12 feet of fence spanning a 200 yard area with only one entry point. This particular night in February, it's about 10 degrees outside, so I cringe to have to do my rounds because it's freezing outside. As I am doing my rounds, I spot what looks like a person sitting on one of the mounds. I walk up shining a light to see clearly, but I spot nothing. Then making my way to the next row, I climb up a mound and look back at the previous row, and there it is again. A person just sitting at the top of the mound. I hauled my butt over into the previous row, running about five mounds to where the spot is, and again nothing. I make the rest of my rounds and walk back to the guard shack. All this while, I could hear some movement around me. Also, a feeling of dread made me feel uncomfortable the whole time. Mind you, there were no people around me that I could run to. In case this was a cryptid, I knew I was in danger. And it was a military base, so no chance that a regular Japanese local just entered in, and was trying to mess around with a guard. I rush my way back to the shack. I turn around and the thing, or person, or the spooky ghost is standing about 10 feet away from the guard shack. I jump inside, lock the sliding door, and just stare out the window. I really studied this thing. There are floodlights every 20 feet or so in the place, so it's actually lit up decently. At one point I get out and use the Japanese phrase we learn in security training. It goes to Meritsuzo, which means stop or I'll shoot. I don't know why, but to this day, that phrase wasn't doing anything. But what else was I supposed to do? It was so cold outside and it barely moved. Its hair was short and cropped around the ears. 
the body was average for a young Japanese adult. I couldn't tell the gender, and its clothing looked gray. The gray look might have been because of the lights above. About 20 minutes after my courageous standoff with the entity, my relief came and flashed its lights so I would open the gate. I saw the security vehicle hit the gate button and looked back and it was gone. I didn't even tell my relief because we probably wouldn't find anything anyway, and I wanted to get the hell out of there. Anyway, that's my night shift story.